This episode of New Politics was released on the 29th of April, 2023, and produced on the land of the Wangal and Wajuk people. Welcome to New Politics. In this episode, a boost in military spending, but what does it mean for funding of other important areas? Could the Dominion case in the United States signal the beginning of the end of News Corporation? And the continuing federal no elition Is it a recipe for success or a disaster in the making? I'm Eddie Djokovic, editor of New Politics. I'm David Lewis, fashion icon. And if you'd like to support New Politics, you can support us through a Patreon subscription, but... Whether it's a subscription or whether you just want to listen in, read our material online or buy a t-shirt or buy a book, it's all available at newpolitics.com.au and all of this is a good way to support independent journalism. It was Anzac Day during the week and what better way to commemorate this by the government announcing an extra $4.1 billion for some long-range missiles, $9 billion towards the AUKUS submarine deal and another $6 billion as part of the review of the Australian Defence Force. This strategic defence review, it was commissioned by the Albanese government a few months after it arrived in office last year and Governments do have the habit of releasing reports during favourable times and just before Anzac Day seemed to be the best time when everyone's got a day off and many people are thinking about military types of things. But the military is like a beast that keeps needing to be fed. There will also be an additional $42 billion spent over the next decade and there's rarely the same cutbacks that apply to virtually every other sector in the community and all the military has to do in Australia is ramp up the fear on China and every dollar that they ask for is given. National security and defence spending are important issues that every country in the world needs to consider and take on seriously, but sometimes in Australia, these matters are like the number one priority and every other issue gets put onto the back burner. It's really odd, and I don't quite understand why we've had so much pumped into the military. I will give the government one little point, and that is that they haven't built it up like it's some kind of brilliant thing and the only true patriots are people who want the defence force funded at the expense of everything else, which the last government really did. This government isn't doing that, but they're still giving them the money. It's always been an odd relationship between defence and government, as you rightly mentioned. Defence just says this is the money we need and they get it. It doesn't happen in health, it doesn't happen in education, it doesn't happen in transport, it doesn't happen in foreign affairs, it doesn't happen in trade. These are departments that you'd think that their advice as to how much they needed would be listened to. Of course, this defence money doesn't give a lot to veterans and veteran welfare and transitioning people out of the defence force into other appropriate jobs or making sure that troops on the ground are properly equipped and properly sourced and properly educated and and all of that. That's where they cut defence. They don't ever cut it in big boys' toys for politicians to dress up. And again, I will give credit to the government in that we haven't had a lot of cosplay shall we say, of of the Liberal government. I'm hoping that it's still far away and the next thing we'll have Minister for Defence dressed up in dispersal pattern jungle greens, standing in front of some toy that makes a large bang sound and can knock a building down. Oh, well, I guess there is that perception that it's usually the conservative governments that drape themselves in the khaki colours and try to make political mileage out of this and Labor governments are not going to be any different in this respect. They might actually do it differently but it might not be as crass and overt Mm. as the Howard, Abbott and Morrison governments or going back in time, the Menzies government. Bob Hawke did get into a bit of warmongering, the Rudd and Gillard governments not so much. Seems like Anthony Albanese is getting right into it now with the Quad meeting last year, extending the AUKUS deal, setting up another Quad meeting in Sydney next month. Now, I'm not naive about the need for all of these alliances and military arrangements. Global geopolitics is complex and there's so many factors involved in the politics and economics of the military industry, not just here but all around the world. But 
how much of this do we need? How many long-range missiles do we need? Why $4.1 million worth of air missiles? Why not $3 billion or $2 billion worth? And the government has consistently said that there are so many budget restraints and it can't do everything that it promised to do. But I think there's a lot of head scratching going on around this funding and questions about what sort of priorities this government actually has. I've seen a lot of disappointment from at least nominal Labor voters, people who voted Labor last election, who are wondering if they actually made the right decision. I've seen a lot of harsh criticism of Penny Wong as foreign minister. And I'm not talking about the usual partisan stuff. Like it's it's one thing for liberal supporters and national supporters and, and One Nation and the rest to be hard. That's okay. That's part of the cut and thrust. And it's where you start to see the grumblings from your own side that things may need review, shall we say. Now, they may not need review. The government may be very happy and there's a long-term strategy uh, will work out for the best for everybody. Uh, It's not apparent what that may be. And it's not obvious that this is a thing. No one in government has mentioned this, but that may be the case. Otherwise, we're not quite sure why this is. It seems that there's a lot of agreements that have been made that the current government is forced to not only accept, but also promote. It's the selling of this as a wonderful thing and that this is how we should do. And the other thing I'll just quickly put in is that defence is not just military defence. There's cultural defence, border defence, medicine defence or disease defence, biological. There's all of that that's really important. When we think in defence, we should think in broader terms. Yes, military defence is something that we, we unfortunately, but we do need it. But there are other ways to defend the country and there are other things that need to be defended from. And we never talk about those. And some of those are possibly more important than boys' toys for perceived or real deficiencies on a subconscious level. Now, the latest budget news is that there will be changes to the single parent payments and and that's a change to pension support that ended when the youngest child turned eight years of age and that was a decision of the Gillard government and it meant that single parents lost $100 per week. We're not sure what the change will be, but the government has suggested that there will be changes to that so that's a good sign now of course most of this is speculation but governments do tend to release small bits and pieces from the budget beforehand to give us an idea of what they're thinking but still the biggest element of criticism is about the rate of job seeker payments and we have to emphasize that nothing has been ruled in or out but the pressure for this is building and building and building and there's been some newcomers into the debate this week. The former Secretary to Treasury, Ken Henry, he's come out to suggest that it would be cruel to not lift the rate of job seeker substantially. The former Reserve Bank Governor, Bernie Fraser, he's come out in support as well. And there's also four more Labor backbenchers coming out in support of her substantial raise. Now, I think we also have to go back a little bit in time and just remember what Anthony Albanese did say on election night. During this campaign, I have put forward a positive, clear plan for a better future for our country. And I have shared the two principles that will drive a government that I lead. No one left behind, because we should always look after the disadvantaged and the vulnerable. But also no one held back. I want to find that common ground where together we can plant our dreams to unite around our shared love of this country, our shared faith in Australia's future, our shared values of fairness and opportunity and hard work and kindness to those in need. So maybe there are going to be some people left behind after all, but I think this is becoming a political problem for Labor. And I think the big issue for me is that they suggested a change to job seeker when they were in opposition, but now that they're in government, they're being so dismissive about it. And as I mentioned, it hasn't actually been ruled out yet. But at the moment, we're mainly getting weasel words from Anthony Albanese, from Jim Chalmers, from Katie Gallagher, that they're not trying to kid anyone, that it's tough being on job seeker, that they wouldn't be able to live on it themselves. And 
or that sort of stuff. But sorry, that's just not good enough. And if, if we wanted to hear the words that the best form of welfare is to get a job, well, we might as well just get Scott Morrison back into the job. But I think the bigger issue is that because they've just been so dismissive of it in the face of all the evidence that's been coming out from all over the place, it's becoming a bigger problem and a bigger political problem than it ever needed to become. And sometimes in politics, it's the smaller manageable issues that snowball into something bigger. And if they're worried about the cost of it, there's other areas that relate to universal service provision, rental assistance, free childcare, utility bills or phone allowances. And I know that there's some of that already. And it doesn't necessarily have to be through additional cash payments. And in the context of the government agreeing to provide a $240 million support package to build an AFL stadium in Hobart, and sure, you could argue that $240 million isn't that much money for the federal government, but at this stage, the optics of this are terrible. And in the context of other substantial spending, a, a refusal to substantially raise the rate of job keeper is going to cause a lot of political problems for the Labor government. I believe, in the years to come, you know, maybe it's backed itself in, into a corner on this issue. But if it doesn't change tack on this, there's probably going to be a leakage of votes and support to the Australian Greens and to other independents in future elections. It's one of those things, isn't it? Sport, it cost the New South Wales government badly uh, when they, instead of replacing a few seats in the stadium, rebuilt the new stadium it probably finished uh, Alan Jones as a political force in New South Wales because he pushed very hard for it. And then the New South Wales government copped a lot of flack for it and led to the end of that government eventually. The sports stadium, while I'm not opposed to something that everyone can use for all kinds of things, how badly is it needed in Hobart, one of our smaller capital cities? And will they be able to attract uh, the types of things that subsidise the, the football and in Sydney and Melbourne, the great, the bigger sports arenas are used for concerts and other events, which subsidizes the sporting games. And that's great. Will Ed Sheeran want to travel to Hobart for an extra couple of hundred thousand dollars when he can sell out another show in Melbourne for essentially a bit less cost? Well, maybe we could also get the homeless to live there as well during the week. That might be the way to do it. Nothing brings out the NIMBYs, <laughs> like suggesting shelter for homeless, no matter how far away or close it is, <laughs> to their place. I think you're right that the the optics, are, it's not a lot of money. It's barely a drip in the $238 billion AUKUS deal that's just been up by another $9 billion. It would hardly be a percentage point. But is that what the people of Hobart really want from the federal government? Now, to our listeners in Tasmania, we're not there. We don't know, really. If you want to correct our assumptions, please let us know. We're not there. We don't know. We're just looking at the optics from outside. And there have also been some more calls for the government to start taxing resources more adequately and getting a better return on these resources that are owned by all Australians and not just the mining and resource companies. And some people have said to us, well, why don't you wait until the budget is announced? But we do have to keep reminding the government that if they're looking at solutions to long-term budget problems, well, this is one area that they seriously need to look at. And it's almost reached the point where... They just have to bite the bullet, put up with whatever garbage is going to be thrown at them by the mining industries, as they did back in 2010 over the mining and super profits taxes, and just go ahead with it. And we have to remember that there were totally different political circumstances 13 years ago, and the Labor government of today has almost got total political cover for any major decision that they make in making mining and resource companies pay a fair and reasonable share of tax, and to a level that's comparable to so many other countries in the world with substantial mineral and mining resources and there's that one trillion dollar national government debt that we keep hearing about there's the endless cost of living debate that we keep hearing about as well and the government complaining about being limited in what they can do given the budget restraints that they've got so i think the public is getting and understanding this political narrative and they've got a better understanding of these budget problems compared to where we might have been back in 2010 and just as a comparison, this year Australia is set to receive $2.6 billion in tax revenue through the Petroleum Resource Rent Tax, and this is 
actually higher in comparison to previous years when it's been collecting under a billion dollars each each of those years. But in comparison, Qatar, which has a similar level of energy exports to Australia, it collected $76 billion this financial year. So $2.6 billion collected in Australia compared to $76 billion in Qatar. And I realise that some of that money from energy exports comes back to Australia through shareholder dividends, but that's an astronomical difference. And David, just think of all the things that we could fund through that additional money. If the Labor government isn't going to fund job seeker payments or social housing adequately or all of those things that they should be supporting, there's at least an extra 10 nuclear submarines that we could buy or a few thousand more long-range missiles that we could direct towards China. So the possibilities are endless, David. I've just completed a report that I'm going to submit to the government about funding two-person political podcasts. And it, it'll only one eligible, and it's about $76 billion worth. So, you know, there, there's that. But in all seriousness, it's one of the things that really, it gets my goat when I look at how, what is all of Australia, the Commonwealth resources, really gets filtered mostly overseas or into the pockets of a few Australians. And then the lies they tell. Uh, no one else could afford to do it. No one would come here. I bet people would come here. We're paying a fair price. Nowhere near a fair price. I suspect that somewhere there is a very clever constitutional lawyer who could take this to the high court and argue successfully that this is anti-constitutional, that the Commonwealth was not set up to enrich a handful of people but to enrich the whole of Australia, maybe not directly but through better services and a better welfare system and a better governance rather than a few doll bludgers doing very little and pocketing a lot and relying on the labour of others to do this. I've gone very Marxist today, haven't I? And here come the next lot of emails. <laughs> it really does annoy me. And you get arguments like, oh, it's their land. They should be able to do what they want on it. It's not their land. They lease the land from the government, who is the landlord. And landlords do have the right to lay down conditions of how their property is to be leased out. And yet successive Australian governments have refused to do this. And the worst that has happened to them is an advertising campaign that I think even then would have been safely ignored by most people and could have been countered by government and party messaging over what is happening and why. The Pharmacy Guild has started this as well, that the poor pharmacists, and by poor pharmacists, I don't mean the local pharmacist being crushed by expensive medicines and um, insurance and all of that, but the, the big chains who are no different really to Coles Woolworths or Harvey Norman or any of the other big retail chains, that they sell medicine doesn't bother them. They just want to make sure that people still shop so that they're complaining that, oh, the prices went down. Who do they think is subsidising those prices? They'll get some of that money back anyway. So I again, I don't understand why anyone in health would want anything less than the improvement of health and access to health care and medicine as the primary priority of any government policy doing or any policy at all dealing with health. But perhaps I don't like money enough. So the Labor government is making some references to a lot of these budgetary issues and all will be revealed on budget night. But sometimes, David, you and I are like little kids waiting for their Christmas presents. But this is one of the more important budgets in recent times. Jim Chalmers did put out a budget in October 2022, but that was more like a warm-up act. But I think this budget will reveal the true nature of this Labor government, whether it's just a business-as-usual type of government or a real reformist government that makes changes that are needed to be made at this point of time in Australia's history. Anthony Albanese did say that he was modelling himself on the Hawke government. And I think that the Hawke government was a far more adventurous government than what we've seen from the Albanese government so far. But this will be its first big opportunity to show what it's really made of. Yeah, there are things that we could criticise on the Hawke government. I uh, think their policy on banking and currency didn't work as well as they thought it might, for example. But 
it was a visionary government. It was an expensive government. It wasn't scared to reform. Well, I guess that's the point. They were unafraid to make these changes. And you can say the same about the Howard government, if we're being really fair. Howard reformed at least the economy in that had long-term consequence. You don't have to agree to acknowledge that they were reformist governments. By the way, I'm not endorsing what Howard did. I'm not endorsing everything the Hawke government did either. But they were reformist governments who were prepared to take on their critics, who were prepared to follow the vision that they had for Australia, and who mostly got through what they wanted. At the end of the Hawke years, Australia was a more expansive and open and tolerant place. At the end of the Howard years, it was a more insular, introspective and less expansive place. Let's put those in terms that are much more positive than perhaps our listeners would put them in. The Albanese government, I think, has to hit the ground running. I think you need to start reforming from your first go because we don't know how many terms that they'll get. There's still only a few seats to take it to minority government, even if the Liberal Party doesn't become an effective opposition next election. There's no guarantee that the Labor Party will expand. Uh, and this is where they can learn lessons from Anna Palaszczuk, Dan Andrews and Mark McGowan, who have run fairly reformist parties at a state level and have been rewarded for it. Chris Minns ran a small target in New South Wales as opposition leader, admittedly, but was really not rewarded for it with now being in minority in, in New South Wales. So it, it is something that leaders tend to do, be a bit timid in their first term. Barack Obama was a bit too timid in his first two years of his first term when he had full control of the House. And there were reasons for that, which he details in his memoirs. But he acknowledged that he should have been bolder while he had control of everything. Now, the Labor government doesn't have control of the Senate, but it has, I think, a fairly sympathetic Senate and a Senate that's prepared to work with it. That can change at any time. All it takes is a couple of resignations or illnesses. It's also personalities and things can change very quickly. There's a few safer seats. Now Aston, I think, took them to three or four, which gives them a bit of a buffer. But a couple of those swinging seats go to by-election and you're in trouble. So now is the time to go, I would argue, and do the reforms and really stamp your initials on how you want Australia to go and see what happens. You're listening to New Politics. You can subscribe to us on Apple or Google Podcasts, Listen through Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud and Amazon Music, or you can find us at newpolitics.com.au. And you can now support New Politics through Patreon. Whenever I'm down, I call on you, my friend. A helping hand you lend in my time of need. Whenever I'm down, I call on you, my friend. I call on you. There's two defamation cases concerning News Corporation, one in the United States and one in Australia. They've had different outcomes, but they've got a similar message, that News Corporation is a diminishing influence and just overstretches itself as a right-wing propaganda unit, and it's now paying the price. In the United States, News Corporation through Fox News settled a defamation case with Dominion Voting Systems for... $787 million US, and that's a quarter of its cash reserves at the moment, and that's for spreading the lies about the 2020 presidential election being rigged and stolen from Donald Trump and the Republican Party. And in Australia, Lachlan Murdoch has dropped his defamation case against Crikey News, claiming that he didn't want to give Crikey any more publicity. Crikey had boosted their subscriptions and raised nearly $600,000 in a GoFundMe campaign, and that's probably disappointing for Crikey because they were attracting a lot of new subscriptions. 
Up until recently, News Corporation would have doubled down, poured more money into litigation costs and defending itself. But this time around, it's given up without much of a fight. And this isn't the end of it. There's also another defamation case in the United States. And this is Smartmatic versus Fox News. And its claim is for $2.7 billion US. So if that one is successful, that's going to cause some serious damage to News Corporation. So We are seeing the humiliation of one of the biggest news media companies in history, and it could also be the beginning of the end of News Corporation as well. There's a theory going around that the Dominion case settled because of the Smartmatic case will be far more damaging. And with all the stuff that came out in the Dominion case, Smartmatic will be able to use that and get a much more punitive finding, provided the courts find in their favour, etc., etc., Certainly News Corp have started damage control. Their highest rating host, Tucker Carlson, was fired unceremoniously. His last broadcast, he said on last Friday, he said, we'll see you Monday, and he was fired on the weekend. He is roughly equivalent to Andrew Bolt here. And I'll be fair to News Corp too, it wasn't just the fact that his ridiculous conspiracy theories around the January 6th insurrection which it was an insurrection, I don't care what the ABC says. It was also because he had behaved appallingly towards staff and the organisation. But I think it's telling that they lose that case. There's talks that other big hosts are going. This must be worrying to people like Andrew Bolt and Peter Credlin and Paul Murray on Sky News. They would be probably talking to their financial advisors and seeing how much of it they haven't spent just in case. And I'm not I have no inside information and I'm not I'm not even saying they deserve to be fired allegedly. I'm just saying that I suspect that the lawyers are going through everything and what is going to damage. And if things are going bad in America, they're likely to go bad in Australia too. It was interesting Interesting that Lachlan Murdoch basically acknowledged that he's hugely disliked in Australia because he said, I'm pulling this out so crikey, don't get extra sponsorship, basically suggesting that crikey did it as a publicity stunt, but also implying, I think, that if you're going to sue someone, you sue someone unpopular and that unpopular person was Lachlan Murdoch. Again, I don't agree with any of that necessarily. (laughs) I just am pointing to various theories that might be used, allegedly, wink, wink, allegedly. So there has been a slow decline of both legacy media in general and for News Corporation, and this is in their ability to influence politics and public opinion. Now, I'm not saying that they haven't got any influence, but their ability to do this has diminished. And Very few companies can afford to lose a quarter of their revenue in the one instance and survive in a meaningful manner. And they've lost this case and $787 million US. Their revenues are down and their subscriptions are down as well. There is a diminishing level of audience numbers in legacy media and also that shift in audiences switching on and just being told what the news is. I think that slowly shifted to younger audiences who are happy to find their own news and niche outlets that deliver something different. So all of these are contributing factors. Now, it did take News Corporation a long time to build itself up, but all empires have their use-by date and an endpoint as well. And I'm not suggesting that this will definitely happen or it will happen quickly, but it's not that ridiculous, I think, to suggest this. We have to remember that the Packer Empire was out of the media business within a decade after Kerry Packard died, so it can happen pretty quickly. And we also have to remember that all of those enterprises that were owned by the Packer Empire, most of those still exist. They just have different owners, and it's still the same broadcasting of lies and mistruth, and and it's the same crackpot news reports and stunts. And for everyone who's thinking that if the Murdoch Empire ends that mainstream media in Australia will automatically become better. Well, that's not necessarily the case. Where there's money to be made and there's someone out there who's got the resources and the ability to provide these types of services, and if there is a receptive audience as well, there's always going to be this type of sensationalism and right-wing media out there. I think one of the things that the legacy media didn't understand was what the impact of the internet would be. Now, they all understood, I think, I think this is fair, that the internet would have a massive impact. But what they didn't understand is that younger generations or, or more tech-savvy people, I think that's fair to say too, 
But when I'm speaking younger generations, I'm meaning this new media consumer. It's not just about the media itself. It's not that we stopped reading newspapers. It's the content. I think there's, it's a much more media savvy group of people who read the media because of the competition. The internet meant that we could compare Australian newspapers to newspapers all over the world. Why would we get what Fairfax thinks of American politics when we can get it from American sources. Same with Britain, same with France, same with Lebanon, same with Italy, same with Russia. Now, I know that in some of these cases, you're not getting great news, but you're getting news from the source not filtered through the political beliefs of a few media moguls in Australia. And I think, too, the way that news travels legacy media struggles with. The 24 news channels don't work, never have. Dreadful. Same content again and again and again, and to keep it full, more inane content. And people get sick of that, I think. And you can also react to the news in real time. You can comment on a story and have not only the writer, but other people come back into it in real time. Stories can be corrected in real time. And I think a lot of the legacy media didn't quite get this. They thought that they would still be seen as you go and you read the Sydney Morning Age or the West Australian Courier or what have you. And the reason I'm marking the names up is not because I've gone insane, but I'm, I'm not trying to single any paper out. I'm trying to show that this is a, a problem across all of legacy media. And I don't think they've got the agility to change. And that's one of the things with the lifetime of a business model. Over time, they lose agility and, and innovation. We can see Microsoft and Apple aren't as innovative as they used to be. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a thing. A 75-year-old sprinter can't run as fast as they could when they were 25. It's just the way things are. And whatever happens to news corporation in the short to medium term, I think its influence over the past 20 to 25 years has been a disaster for good quality journalism in mm. Australia. And that's also coincided with an extended period of coalition government since 1996. And if you have a look at the influences at the ABC and over at the old Fairfax Media, which is now Nine Media, a lot of news corporation journalists are now working at the ABC. So it's not just the on-air talent. There's a lot of senior managers from news corporation who now work at the ABC and all of these people, they've got that focus on those key commercial AB demographics. They've fundamentally changed the ABC, so it's lost its point of difference and has become a dumbed-down news operation, and, and it's also very similar to a lot of other material that you can find within the mainstream media. So I think this is the legacy of news corporations. fundamentally changed news and, and current affairs for the worst in Australia, and generally I think there is a good appetite for good quality journalism in different niche markets but it's just that it's less likely that good quality journalism will be found in legacy media i think that's right i mean i will defend the abc a little bit in that there are still some very good shows landline for example not that i get a lot out of it because i don't live on the land anymore but it's always fair and and it seems to be always pretty balanced and i guess because there's nothing in stake for it am and pm seem to have maintained their quality shows like uh q and a are unwatchable unless there's a really good panel on it but usually they have in a panel of six there'll be five really good people and then some unqualified person who is there to I don't know what, and then inane and stupid questions from the audience. So I think that there's still hope for the ABC and that there is still good shows on there and even good new shows, but there's a worry. We've got to be sure that we get in decent panels on Q&A, that we get in decent topics on Insiders. I don't think we should use commercial journalists who are employed by other big companies on insiders. I don't think that helps. Even people who give a reasonable viewpoint, I think it's better to use independent journalists. And I don't necessarily mean us, though I'm open to offers, but big names who, who are freelancers, ABC journalists, and ABC journalists not from the other shows, but from other states. People who, you know, there might be the Melbourne correspondent or the Adelaide correspondent or the whatever, regional correspondents, and bring them in and let them talk. 
I think that's better rather than having the same six News Corp people on that uh, are really an argument for sleeping in on a Sunday. You're listening to New Politics. You can subscribe to us on Apple or Google Podcasts, listen through Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud and Amazon Music, or you can find us at newpolitics.com.au. And you can now support New Politics through Patreon. There was a news poll released last week and as predicted, the news is getting worse for the coalition. It's just confirming the poor standing of the coalition and the leader of the opposition, Peter Dutton. And as we've reported in the past, this can provide an opportunity for change and perhaps get the people in the Liberal Party to start thinking that things are not currently working and doing politics differently might be a better option. But at the moment, it's just opposition for the sake of opposition. And every announcement of a government program is greeted with a negative response from the coalition. Inflation has come down to 7%. The shadow treasurer, Angus Taylor, he announces that this is terrible news and the government hasn't got an understanding of the pain that the electorate is going through. The government has announced a two-for-one prescriptions program, which essentially halves the costs of medicines. But the shadow finance minister, Senator Jane Hume, she's come out to say that there's lots of concerns about this plan that won't do very much about the cost of living pressures. And they've actually just used the words coming from the Pharmacy Guild about how the policy is somehow going to be dangerous for children and cost lives. And they're coming out so negatively about this plan, even though this is the plan that they seriously considered introducing in 2018 when they were last in government. And we see it with the voice of parliament. Every response from the coalition on this is negative. They ask the government for more details. And when they get those details, they ask for more or they ask for something different to what they ask for. Now, there's no question that the Labor government is facing a lot of pressure at the moment with developing the budget and pushing back on some of those issues that you'd normally expect to Labor government to fund. But opposition, for the sake of opposition, just doesn't work anymore. When Labor was in opposition, they said that they would offer support to the coalition government when needed and would be a constructive opposition. And of course, that was during the onset of the pandemic. But the coalition ended up being thrown out of office and now they're languishing in the opinion polls. But I think they just need to look across at Anthony Albanese for his time in opposition. And I think that's the template for getting back into government during these times. But it's like the coalition has just got this terrible habit, deny everything, oppose everything, support nothing, propose nothing, even when it would be in their best interest to do the opposite and support what's in the public interest. We saw the results of continual opposition with the disastrous and failed Abbott ministries. We will see it again. We saw it again really with the Morrison ministries and the Turnbull ministries too. You need to oppose what needs to be opposed with cogent and actual argument, support what needs to be supported with cogent and actual argument, and build a policy and an alternate vision for how government should be done. It's not that hard in theory. Of course, it's very hard in practice for all kinds of reasons, but that's the job of an opposition. And that's what all the effective oppositions did. The Whitlam opposition was very effective. The Howard opposition was very effective. Now, an opposition can be helped by a floundering government. And despite all our criticisms, the government isn't floundering at the moment. It's still very unified behind the leadership team. It is presenting well to most people. It is achieving what it's set out to achieve for the most part, even if that's not what we thought it was going to set out to achieve. And that makes things that little bit harder for the government. But a good opposition 
can tear down an achieving government by finding those flaws and working on them, all the while building a vision for the country. And I don't think that the current Liberal Party has shown any interest in this. I think it just wants to get back into power as quickly as it can. They must be worried about the anti-corruption commission coming as some of their leadership candidates will probably feature in them highly. So replacing Peter Dutton with someone who may not come out well of a corruption investigation isn't going to help them at all. It's probably time that they start the mass resignations and restarting of the party with better candidates. And David, I know that we are sounding a little bit like a broken record about the coalition and a few of our listeners have suggested that the coalition is no longer important and we shouldn't highlight them as much and I guess that's why we're talking about it towards the end of the program rather than at the beginning and all of this is probably true but for the coalition you can't just keep saying no to everything, you can't just keep ignoring all the good advice that people are giving you and expect to somehow become electable and it's almost like you and I, David, we've become coalition political advisors, you know, providing all the news to the thousands of listeners that we have each and every week and all of those people in the Liberal Party who do listen into us and the Liberal Party MPs are just saying, well, no thanks to all of the advice that we are providing to them and we'll just do it our way and as far as I'm concerned, it's their loss, but we are just trying to give them a helping hand <laughs> and that's an issue for the Liberal Party in the short term, but there is a longer term dynamic in play not just for the coalition and for conservative parties, but for the Labor Party as well. And there have been suggestions that due to demographic changes and voting patterns, this current Labor government could be the last time that we end up with a majority government. And there has been a steady decline in the primary vote for the major political parties since the 1980s. And it has dropped under 70% for the first time in the 2022 federal election, and there's no indication that this is going to change any time soon. But I think the mainstream party that manages this situation the best at this stage will have a better chance of long-term survival and being in a position where it can form a government. It might not be a majority government, but it can form a minority government. And for the first time ever at the last election, the Australian Greens won a lower house seat off the the Liberal Party and there's also all of those seats picked up by the Teal Independents and they were all lost by the Liberal Party so because it's becoming easier for the Greens and for Independents to win lower house seats we'll probably end up having more minority governments in the future. Now we haven't got that at the moment it's still a Labor majority government but in the future that might change and I don't actually have a problem with that. Multi-party coalitions have worked quite well in many countries around the world. I probably wouldn't use Italy or Israel as an example for this but in most countries like Germany and New Zealand a coalition of like-minded parties to form government is the norm rather than the exception and we might have to get used to these situations in future years in Australia? It shows a failure of the two, really three, party system we have here, that the two major parties covered it up between themselves. And again, that lack of agility that I alluded to in the media is probably happening to the parties. The Labor Party is, what, 130 years old, more or less, depending on how you count the splits as they become new parties. The Liberal Party is not much younger, really. Again, they start as what the protectionists and the, the free traders become the Liberal Party, become the Nationalist Party, become the United Australia Party, become the Liberal Party. But it's essentially the same party. It could be that this model is failing and that we need the smaller parties and the independents. Certainly there's a lot of enthusiasm within the smaller parties, within the independents. We've interviewed quite a lot of them and I was impressed with the capabilities. I was impressed with the passions for meaningful reform. I didn't agree with everything everybody said, by no means. But to see parties and candidates who had thought through things and were not just parroting what had been decided somewhere else. And I also think that because of the success of the Australian Greens and independents, there's probably people out there in the community thinking, well, it's not impossible to become a Member of Parliament. I don't have to try and do it through the Labor Party or the 
Liberal Party, which seems impenetrable sometimes, and this is offering an incentive for people to participate in politics. Getting into Parliament isn't as difficult as it might have been 40 or 50 years ago. Yeah, and those independents tended to be a mixture of extraordinary and lucky. And to be an independent, you probably need to have that mix. What we don't want, of course, is shadow candidates who are really part of one of the other parties. And of course, each party runs these joke figures, particularly in the Senate, to shuffle preferences through. And in some cases, they end up winning. And then (laughs) you get the uh, Yahoo Looney party winning a seat. And it turns out that Yahoo Looney is a code for young liberal. (laughs) And they're just liberal candidates with no real alternate to the major parties. Labor does it too. I think that needs to be said. We probably need some kind of reform to the voting system as well because it's still favouring the two major parties as they're declining in relevance. Now, the relevance is a slow decline. I think we will see Liberal and Labour at the next probably even 10 or 12 elections as major forces, although things can happen very quickly. But we need to make sure that however it evolves, that it evolves somewhat naturally and that it is for the best interests of Australia. And we should acknowledge the passions of the major parties and the people who joined the major parties when they were 16 and stayed in it till they were 80, fighting every day for what they believed in. I think that needs to be acknowledged in any discussion of party. That's it for this episode of New Politics. Thanks for listening in. And if you'd like to support our style of journalism and commentary, please make a donation at our website at newpolitics.com.au. We don't beg, plead, beseech or gaslight you about journalism coming to an end. We just keep it very simple. If you like what we do, please send some support our way. It keeps our commitment to independent journalism ticking along. I'm Eddie Djokovic. Thanks for listening in and it's goodbye to our listeners. I'm David Lewis. We'll see you next time. Thank you.